Signs of the Southland, Monday, April 1st, 2024. Happy April Fool's Day, everyone. As an introduction, what was your favorite April Fool's joke that you saw today? I mean, I saw that uh, a post on the aviation interwebs about how Boeing was inventing the 797, uh, and it was just them changing the three in 737 to a nine on everything. I thought that was pretty funny, but that's pretty specific to my my interests. So that's pretty good. Tech uh, last night put up that the, uh, the the letters got taken down from Tech Tower because they I think they fell off or something like that. And so now no it's no, no, no 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 it was, it was, was they were intentionally taken off. That's right. Light that's right. pollution concerns. Light pollution. Yeah. So now it's just Tower. Today it's just known as Tower. Still the G and also the E, C, and H. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, there's an order to it, right? Like you're supposed to eventually yeah. Oh, yeah. take one off of all four sides. And then, then you go for the E's and you go for the C's and you go for the H's. Yeah. That, That's why be. they gave me that little medal when I graduated. It's because I memorized all that stuff. That Nerd. was the thing. Don't you remember? This is a rec club Kitty thing. was handing those. No. Yeah, so it's yeah. It, it, for, for our listeners who don't uh who are still in school and, and can still do this um it was run by i think student media but then rec club took it over wherein if you got enough of like the classic georgia tech traditions they give you a little medal um so m- me being a bit of a try hard i was like sure i i got some time i'll uh i'll make note of it almost ran out of time because then a pandemic hit whoops um, but uh, luckily, uh, graduating with my master's, I counted the stuff I did as a as an undergrad. But basically, if you can submit pictures for having done the traditions keepers for, you know, it's like all the core ones and then some of the this, that and the other thing, um, they'll, they'll give you a medal. So if you're still in school, not, go check it out. I definitely did not know this existed. So hmm. right, club.org oh, hold on. slash traditions keepers, hold on, hold by on, the way. Hold on. It's on my wall. This We're doing this live. Podcasting is a visual it's a medium. Visual of medium. <laughs> People aren't going to be able to see it. It's yeah, it's it's buzz gold and black and white, and it says. That's sure enough. That this is a medal. This is a medal. Yeah, it right is a medal. Jake, are you are you sure you actually want this medal, considering its color scheme? <laughs> it's black and yellow and white. Yeah, no, I. It's buzz. I'm colored. rethinking it's all buzz my colored. life decisions. It's buzz but, colored. Yeah, you know it'd be real spooky if they made a buzz costume that was in the actual tech gold and navy. I feel like that would be just real oh, uncanny. We don't real want that. Why, we don't why want do that. you got to do this? Why do you got to do this? Stop, stop. We're moving on. We're moving on. A couple of introductory bits of news before we get fully started. Uh, construction has officially started on the new athletics facility, Athletics HQ, on the corner of Techwood and Bobby Dodway, uh, named the, what is it, the Thomas A. Fanning Student Performance Center. If I remember correctly from the press release, um, so I think has uh, as Jack posted on Twitter the entirety of the front uh, corner uh, or the north. What is that? The northeast corner of Bobby Dodd Stadium is entirely under construction. So keep that in mind if you are around those parts of campus. Speaking of football uh, and Bobby Dodd Stadium. The spring game, the football spring game, has a couple of additional accoutrements, if you will, uh, added to its pregame festivities uh, on the 13th of April. There will be a yard sale, the Gasparilla Bowl, Gasparilla, Gasparilla, at some point they'll tell me how to pronounce it. Uh, Gasparilla Bowl trophy will be on display, uh, and there will be a nice Techwood market uh, as well. Any other notes on, on the spring game, gentlemen, before we move on? Uh, clarify uh, they mean by yard sale they mean just surplus merch that they have yeah. on hand uh and then the techwood market think of it as the the block party just sized down and on techwood drive instead of on north ave yeah i uh i'll note that those yard sales wind up being pretty interesting i went to the track and field one before oh the i remember this. scrimmage years ago and i got like a nice pair of sweatpants for like five ten bucks a pair of socks for like a dollar i mean you know, it, it, it's not the, it was still Russell Athletic, and I think we were like three years into the Adidas era, but it says GT on it, this golden navy. <laughs> you could do worse. Cheap slash free gear is still cheap slash free gear, you know? 
Yes. It's exactly. more comfortable because you paid less for it. That's a great attitude. I love that. <laughs> it's probably goes without, it probably goes without saying, but the gates next to Cali Plaza and Cali Plaza are like totally not usable for this game. Just because that is yeah. the 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 at the active construction site takes up basically everything from where the football area that building starts to the sidewalk to the staircase by the Bobby Dodd statue. So yeah, it's fun to look at. I guess they took out the Heisman statue today. The plaques are off the building now. Uh, so they're moving things. Yeah, I don't know if they'll move Bobby Dodd statue, but they had to. They definitely had to move the Heisman statue. So that is. Well, I imagine as long as he comes because, back. You know. I, I hope he. I assume he will. Which we just didn't want to get crushed by something. I, I think that Bobby Dodd is in that spot for a reason, and this is me just completely off the wall going for this, but I'm pretty sure there was some sort of Letterman effort in terms of like sponsoring the the plaza and the stairs there where the band warms up. So I I think that's probably static, but I'm interested to see just how the exact footprint changes because, and and this is us getting a little off the rails here, but we did notice that, you know, it's a, it's a pretty short building today, the edge building, if you look at it from the stadium side and, you know how the how the uh, the new corner will shake out will be interesting because it's short and tight and and you know it looks like it's a, a lot more airy in the um, in the rendering. So at yeah. least for me, I'm interested to see how that shakes out. They also lose a lot of square footage because the entrance is elevated by like half a mm-hmm. story. So you have all these yep. ADA accessible ramps you have to build to get in there. Yep. And so if this, I think this I think the renderings have this the entrance on the actual ground this time, so they'll have to be able to take up more. Sp- more sidewalk space will be able to be used, and like if they won't have to waste yeah. as much space on accessibility. <laughs> they they call the current style brutalism for a reason. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not. It's like a fortress. It's a concrete so. brick. Let's be clear. It's yes. it's yeah. It's it's bad. It's, it's a bad. slab of concrete, but it's our slab <sighs> of concrete. So that's, yeah. the, that's what matters. Spirit. Uh, let's talk about some ha- goings on in our slab of bricks at O'Keefe Gymnasium. Volleyball started its spring scrimmage schedule with three home fixtures uh, alongside the Big South Invitational, as we discussed last week, uh, going on at GWCC downtown. Your three fixtures for this weekend, a 3-1 win versus Tennessee, a 2-1 win versus Virginia, and another 2-1 win versus Auburn. Jack, you were on site for a couple of these. What did you see? I was there for the Tennessee game. That was the only one I saw, but that seemed to be the main one because they did play that full They played that full five, and they were going to plan to play it a f- best of five. Um, to, of note, Tennessee was the ninth-ranked team in the final rankings last year. We were 14th, uh, so that was... Not, not, not a bad match at all. They were good. They had some great middle blocking, had some good hitting. Um, and we basically played the starters per normal for the first three sets. Uh, Liv Mogridge did not play. I'm guessing just no need to actually like put any stress on her, considering that he is probably not all the way, all the way gone, because the injuries do take time to heal. Um, but beyond that, uh, Luana Emiliano filled in it. She took this main uh, was it setter role, and she was great. Uh, they did the normal six-two formation rotation stuff they do with uh, Suarez and Mendez and all that stuff, um, and then a couple of the freshmen got to come in. Logan Wiley, who we've mentioned, uh, she played a little bit in that fourth. The fourth set was just basically all subs, so it was our starters one-two-one, and then the subs one against their subs one nothing. Uh, but it was tight. Every every set went. I think only the second set went to twenty-five seventeen. Everything else was in the twenties for both teams, so it was tight. It was. Good volleyball, and there was a lot of kids from a lot of players from that youth tournament that were at that match in the morning match. Like it was a ten a.m. match. Uh, it was very, very like really, really full for a ten a.m. exhibition match. Uh, so they they did well. I was good good to see. Um, those coaches were in their normal yelling at the refs, couldn't believe calls and stuff like that per normal because even the, even these practice matches mean a lot to them. Um, Bianca Bertolino, I I, I think did zero things were wrong like her serve was perfect she could get any shots she wanted from the outside it was insane uh she she has gotten better in the last couple months good i mean uh, one thing that i am, am heartened to hear is just the, the turnout i mean if you sustain a, a successful program for long enough people associate with you with that but that success right it's not a flash yeah. in the pan it's georgia tech and tennessee you know those are I guess names you can you can recruit to, and if if you're a you know kid trying to notice, you think you got a chance. I, I see no no reason for them 
not to be in in the building. So that's that's great to hear. One thing that I did notice, I was in the airport on on Friday flying up uh, for for some Easter holidays with family. I noticed people were already leaving the tournament, so I thought that was a little odd because I thought that went into the weekend. It's, but uh, it's just so completely co- unrelated to Georgia Tech. Yeah. But I assume it's so big that like people are coming and going. All yeah, the time. it's like that. Yeah, I, I, not everyone's scheduled. I don't think everyone's leaving on mass on Thursday, Sunday, or Saturday or whatever the final day of that is. So, yeah, good Makes stuff. Uh, the only other note that I had from this is that there was also an open practice. I think the day before these scrimmages, uh, Thursday. Was, yeah, yeah, Thursday had. Looked, uh, there were people there. I didn't go, but their photos made it seem like there was at least some folks there. I mean, this, this, yeah, this, I mean, for a practice, it seemed for an open practice, it seemed pretty well attended. So. I'll take. I mean, the, that that tournament was also happening then too. So it's. I mean, if there was going to be a, if a team couldn't go on Saturday, they could at least go on that Thursday and watch them play too. Um, even that set those Saturday games, like some faces I recognize from just going to so many games, like the art, like season ticket holders were going to these games, these matches as well. So I, the, the crowd that they have is extremely committed, as Jake was noting. Mm-hmm. Good deal. Uh, next, the next spring scrimmage fixture is this weekend in Athens. So stay tuned for some updates from there. But for now, let's flip over to golf, who was at the Goodwin in the Bay Area this past weekend. They finished fifth uh, at six over par. Uh, on the weekend, the winner. We don't have to talk about them, but they were the only team under par. At one under, so this was a very, very difficult course on the week. Uh, Some other conference schools that were in the mix, Stanford and Clemson. Uh, So get your really good competition in there. Uh, Tennessee was also in the mix there as well. I I looked at the field and it was very weirdly like, you know, you have your Stanford, your Tennessee, your Clemson, and then a bunch of West Coast schools because it's on the West Coast. And then also App State. And Howard, I, gotta get turned out somehow. I guess uh, I don't know. I don't know how the I don't know how the uh, sausage gets made on some of these tournaments, but this is how the how these fields get put together in terms of individual scores. Christo Lamprecht, Bartley Forrester tied for eleventh, uh, both at even. Uh, Kim Carson Kim at tied for thirty. Third at three over. Hiroshi Tai tied for 68th at eight over. And uh, Cal Fontenot uh, tied for 80th at nine over, but his score did not count towards the team score. The final event of the golf regular season calendar is Calusa Cup. That is next weekend in Naples, Florida. Gentlemen, anything on golf before we keep trucking along? Bartley's. Final round was a 66. That's his best uh, of the season. So at least of the spring portion so far. So good to see some hot golf with ACC's two weeks away. Uh, that's ACC's effectively is NCA proto NCAAs in terms of the level of talent we're going to be facing. So got to get hot at the right time as we're seeing with both NC State basketball teams right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there that's the place to be. But I guess we're. Uh... We're kind of past our basketball era, so maybe we uh, we skip on by that. The other thing that I'll notice here is that if we're taking a look, or at least we're taking a more future-facing look on this team, they've been consistently that top five, six in the results, at least this spring so far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think at this point last year, they were probably like that first or third in a lot of their uh, tournaments. So it's like a slightly lower gear. I don't necessarily think it's predictive. But of, like barely lower too. Like barely lower. Yeah. Like it's like it's in that range of where they could, like last year could have been at this exact same spot. It could have been plus a few, a few strokes better, a few strokes worse. Like it's just right in that middle tier. Of just like they're obviously in that still in that elite tier. Um, And then just you miss a few putts here and there. And then, well, there you go. Now you're fifth at a few strokes under where you want it to be. But yeah, and I, I, I think, well, to our benefit, I think Lambrecht has sort of settled in, and and he's oh, gotten a little yeah. bit more consistent as the season has has dragged on. So hopefully that bodes well as we head into the back stretch of the slate and towards the postseason. So we'll keep an eye on that. Let's talk about softball next. The first game of the week was at Kennesaw State, and that was postponed due to weather. Weather this. This past week was nasty at times. Yeah. 
Uh, but let's, and that really did not end for the entirety of the week as Tech went up to Syracuse. Uh, a one two series loss in, in one game that had a frozen field situation. Also, yeah. uh, really weird stuff. Uh, I'll get the results out to you and then, and Jack, we can walk through the performance here. Game one, a 5 1 victory for Tech. Um, game two, a 6 5 close loss for Tech. And then game three, a uh, 7 1 victory for Syracuse. A very a blowout loss there so jack what do you got for me here we saw that article last week where we talked about how tech was getting really good at hitting and the, <laughs> you know not a not a particularly good performance at the plate this week in comparison. no not at all i mean it, uh, it, there's some pitching spots where we could have been helped as well i mean sophia voiles was fantastic it, it's basically if sophia is pitching we have a much better shot compared to our other pitchers that we're going to get a win down um Norton had, I mean, it, there's so many games. Someone's going to have the off night, the off game. Eventually, it seemed like Kinsey Norton had hers during this series as well, and then it plummeted to sub freezing temperatures. And, and the stuff gets weird in games like that when you're dealing with just weirdness in that in that regard. I mean, they're Oof. still making solid contact, but it's not great. Uh, I the note Michaela Caulfield she pitched when she finished the uh, in game two. She pitched four and a third innings scoreless, which react to which and then she pitched them in game three that got her to 10.1 innings pitch but without allowing an earned run which was an inning worse than what nelman's career started with so she started really good for a game and a half and then finally syracuse was the ones that got her um uh, yeah i don't know this doesn't seem like the worst series ever but also what well, we should have won like we should have won. i uh we should have won two of these jack you've opened a horrible door for me to be a pedant uh it was only Sub zero from four a.m. to six a.m. on Friday as oh, a northerner. I, I, uh, I, I have to do uh, make sure we set the record straight on that. But building off of the, um, the the commentary there, I just feel like this is a series we had to have. Um, Syracuse, they're solid. They're top one hundred team. They're not bad, and it's it's in their building in in bad weather, cold weather, uh, weather that southern teams usually get dinged for having to go into like it it Mm -hmm. happens in all the outdoor sports uh of going up north and you know i was listening to d1 baseball a couple weeks ago and they're saying the same thing about miami visiting notre dame that you know it it just happens but that's also the sport right you got to take care take care of business and i feel like this is a a take care of business series uh it really would have been nice to get scratch another run or two across in that uh in that second game I, i think it's unreasonable to ask for to expect sweeps but Syracuse has played a decent schedule um a, a harder one than than Georgia Tech to be frank um but uh I, I do think Tech grades out a little bit higher and and like I said it's one of those where man you just kind of wish you had the second game not again not the worst thing in the world not dire but it, it does push us out of uh out of my my tournament field at least so that's kind of where I set my mood at a couple of notes from me uh on that this is Tech's third straight ACC series loss. Um, mm-hmm. So they have not won an ACC series since that NC State series to open the slate. On Syracuse specifically, Jake, do you remember a couple years ago when Syracuse softball and women's basketball basically imploded in back-to-back months? Did with volleyball also scandals? implode? in that year too or was because Syracuse more or less, imploded their volleyball team in the last few years here too the the, the scandal that caused it, I, I don't remember the exact details of the scandal itself and we'll set that part aside for now but the, the roster exploded or the roster imploded for, for lack yeah. of a better term mm-hmm. and now you sort of look at that in or you look at that from now and you're saying okay well in women's basketball Syracuse has obviously turned into a top 25 caliber team right um yeah. volleyball I think they're still having trouble so can't really yeah. put too much stock in that but now tech who has at least you can put some thought towards okay tech has a talent advantage in this series at, against a team that did have to retool its entire roster cover to cover a couple of years ago and was not necessarily good when they had to do that. 
I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't feel good about this. Like that, there's, okay. it's, it's foreboding. I was me. looking at, I'm looking at the standings. Those were Syracuse's first home games of the season. Mm-hmm. They hadn't played yeah. it once at home, so I would not discount a. Thank God we're Very home motivated. now. Yeah, yeah, like they finally get to play on their actual stadium and the, all the comforts that that brings. So I would not discount that at all. Uh, just some other just conference based stats. Our ninety one conference runs are second only to Virginia Tech's ninety six. Uh, they also have just only twenty seven more runs than us on the season. Um, so like, Nin- we're still 90- we're still, still scoring. A that bunch. was that was wins. You said ninety one. No, ninety one runs scored. In our, runs in scored. Split. Okay. Yeah. 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 Conference play. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Went right over my head. That said, we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Granted, this and uh, looking back, we played Pitt and NC State. They both only have one conference win so far. So those are the ones yeah. you absolutely had to have. Syracuse's third is we played the bottom three teams in the conference right now and beat. We won the series in two of those cases. Um, and then Louisville's coming up. That's their fourth. Their bottom. They're the fourth worst right now by our standings. Uh, so like you gotta win. Like we have to keep winning these games. And so yeah, losing these series is no longer excusable. Pending, yeah, I know well, the various Louisville things we have around this particular group. I was, I was going to say, Pitt's one win is against Louisville. D- dare I say, that's a series that if you're Georgia Tech, you're looking at it as something they need to win. And if you're Louisville, you're looking at it as something you need to win. And, and Tech, of course, um, does have the scheduled uh, break from conference play this week, but they head to Auburn to play against. This is a... A daunting slate, certainly more daunting than the Syracuse team they just played, and certainly more daunting than the Louisville one that comes up next. The the collection of teams, for for the record, to just put it out there, is Troy, they get Wednesday. Uh, That'll be actually at home, not yet in Auburn. But then they get Auburn in Auburn on Friday, uh, Louisiana Tech in Auburn uh, on Saturday, and then a doubleheader later game uh, against Auburn later on Saturday. Uh, These teams are... Quite good. Um, Lu- Louisiana Tech is one of the best mid majors in the sport. I, I believe they're um, currently leading the CUSA, if not uh, in standing, certainly in metrics. Yeah, I, I see them as a top forty team uh, by by quite a, a decent margin that would put them in the field mm-hmm. as an at large. Auburn, uh, of course, most SEC teams are pretty good, but playing a top twenty five team uh, on their home turf is pretty solid. And then even uh, even Troy rates out pretty similar to Georgia Tech at, at you know, it's top 100 team. So these are the games where they got to prove themselves. Like, this is where you got to yep. take the learnings from Clearwater and put it to work. Like, get that, figure out whatever pitching things you get. Like, hit, hit the same way. If you hit the same way, we're fine in terms of like, yep. you can't say that was bad, but like, you got to figure out ways to not allow 10 runs a game. Not, don't rely on scoring nine, but like, just make sure you don't allow like seven or eight every time. Can I borrow a concept that Kurt Hoyt brought over to talk about women's basketball? Yeah. And I think it's super telling. Um, this team's in search of its marquee win. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah. Like, I think that's and, fair. and Auburn's a great chance to get one, but like they've been treading water against teams they rate very similarly against. That's fine, but you, you got to get one or two of these and, and, you know, stack up some more of these wins if you want to be in the tournament picture, yeah. I feel like. Yeah, because the it's the only ones you have. The only chance you have left are this and Virginia Tech. Like yep. that's it. And Virginia Tech's a little spooky. So <laughs> and that's a, you know, the it's, show. It's, spooky, it's a chance in name only. It's spooky Jack. and on the road. So yeah, this is yeah. You have to do it now. Um, I'm just looking at our RPI, not that it's the gospel or anything like that. But Louisiana Tech's 45th and Auburn's 21st. So I'll add to that. Tech is 54th in, in RPI. At looking at our. Friends, softball stat lines, rankings, their 15th in offensive rank, 160th, still so pretty low in defensive rank, and have slid down to 61st in overall rank. Uh, so they yeah, are and- still 1-8 and eight in Q1 games. So I, that kind of tells you the story, mm-hmm. like J- yeah. Jake, you were saying. It's like they're able to either 5-2 and two in Q2 and 8-2 and, eight and two in Q3. They're able to beat teams right around their skill level that are even with them. But once it, once you get one little ding above, it kind of kind of goes to hell. Yeah, and and I I do want to just kind of close or round out. We we've talked at least alluded to Virginia Tech, Louisville, and this tournament situation this weekend. The last team Tech has to close out ACC plays Virginia. Uh, the the end of the season is coming up 
remarkably soon. Um, and, mm-hmm. and getting Virginia at Tech is a good thing. They've acquitted themselves well this year. So it, it's uh, certainly a, a spooky slate, you know, three or even four out of the next uh, four weekends. All these teams have quite a bit to play for, whether you're Louisiana Tech, Auburn, Louisville, Virginia Tech or Virginia, and we can, you know, talk about midweeks when we get there. But this is we're staring into the teeth of the schedule, and, and that's where I think a lot's gonna, a lot's gonna shake out, at the, you know, in, in terms of moving the needle from the current twenty three and fourteen to, you know, how that ter- translates into ACC tournament selection, sure, but also, or I mean, seating, but uh, also, you know, NCAA tournament selection too. Seems good to me. Let's talk about those future fixtures. You mentioned them, but I just want to make sure it gets on everyone's radar. Wednesday, Tech will play Troy at home. Friday will be Auburn at Auburn. Saturday will be Louisiana Tech at Auburn. Uh, And then Saturday, the matinee at Auburn will also be at Auburn. Let's flip over to baseball. And uh, gentlemen... It's it's not looking too good. We might have some big problems. General, we might have it's some not looking too here. good in general. Tech swept by Boston College this weekend, and it did not look pretty at any juncture. Uh, Boston, Jake, check me on this, but Boston College's baseball team has uh, not been. I'm going to try to pick my words carefully. The caliber of talent that Boston College, in terms of baseball, brings in on a regular basis is not necessarily immediately comparable to Tex, would you say? From a purely recruiting standpoint, I think the answer is yes. However, this is despite coach turnover year over year. Last year's Boston College team was a pretty darn good team. Uh, they they went 37 and 20. Uh, and then wound up uh, in a somewhat spooky regional in in Tuscaloosa um, and, and played their way through to the, the regional final where they lost to the home team. But um, yeah, I mean, recruiting wise, sure. But this is a team that's gotten more out of less and, and kind of the same way we talked about, you know, Northern Northern schools just a couple of minutes ago with Syracuse. Like, you know, Boston College is a team that develops players pretty darn well. Uh, and I think it's one that's built themselves a program that really this year has kind of kept things humming along as well as you can reasonably expect, despite, you know, losing their coach to Penn state. I, I think this is kind of where we get into the discussion of tech tech's problems are at this stage of the season. They're about halfway through the slate are effectively the same as what we mentioned to start the year, right? They still struggle with pitching that they're hitting. Okay. But at the point at the rate that they're giving runs up to opponents it's unsustainable to have to rely on clutch hitting or hitting period to to bail you out and it sort of begs the question what the next steps are right i i I do want to couch this real quick with we're we're talking like this not just in a Hey, like the Boston College series did not go as expected. Georgia Tech played Boston College, which is by all metrics, a a reasonable bubble or potential regional team. North Carolina, which is probably a a top 10 team, maybe top five by most ways you slice it Mm -hmm. or most ways you analyze it. But one that's shown flashes uh, against NC State, another top 20, top 25 um, caliber talent wise, you know, type team. I do want to couch it with that. Like this is a team that has shown flashes, but we still cannot pitch to save our freaking lives. Yeah. Our, and, our that, main, and that's our the main, end all be all, right? Our like, main names from is... last year. Our main names from last year. Terry Busey, he's only appeared in six games. He's got a 15.75 ERA right now. Ben Kingston at 4.61. That's fine. Uh Carson Bowers at 249. He's pitched he's pitched well in in, in his innings so far. Uh, and then Logan McGuire's done okay. Aiden Infinitary's done well. It's basically outside of Ballard and Finitary, you're just praying. It's 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 just that bad. Like we can hit fine. Drew Burst still eighth in the country in homers. He's not gonna hit four homers a game all the time, and he very much hasn't ever since that game as well. Uh, when he got to got himself to ten or eleven or whatever that was. Or but after the Georgia series, save the NC State series, we, we should have gotten run ruled in the third game of the series at home. 
and we couldn't get the deal, the job done in extras because we just didn't have the arms to get through the 10th inning. Uh, and, and there are still games where we just can't hit for anything. We just barely beat Georgia State a couple weeks ago. Like that took some absolute magic from Burris and and Ellis. So, uh, it, it, when you try the same thing over and over again, do, do you think that calls for a, a, a mix up in a way? Maybe. I'll yeah. add this. I'll add this to the mix because Jake, I know you have some other thoughts on that too. This is Tech's sixth consecutive loss. Uh, they are now three and six in ACC play after starting out three and zero. Uh, North Carolina is back on top of the uh, of the coastal at, at ten and two, um, and they've won nine straight. So, and I'm pretty sure that includes that includes the, our games, yeah. series. Yeah. So, I, it, <laughs> I feel like we swing somewhat all over the map. There's times when I'm I'm the optimist and Jack's the optimist at other times, and <laughs> you know that's that what that's what makes for good banter. And I think the most um, telling thing to me is that it seems like we've all kind of arrived in a very similar spot here. Um, we, we've we noted that we Tech plays in a tough neighborhood, right? But they have a slate of brand new facilities. They've been recruiting very well. And at the end of the day, how many pitching coaches can one go through? I think that's, that's where my thought keeps going back to. It seems like we've tried this before. Like, mm-hmm. okay, there, there were... The, the, that 2019 team, we talk about them all the time. They were great. They were wonderful. Then you bring in Danny Burrell. Okay, this team's going to get to the next level. And it never got there. And granted, it's been half a season. But at the at the same time, like... That's... It, that's ha- I mean, half, half the games is... It's half, uh, yeah, half the games real, are over. That's a real sample size now. That's and, You can predict off of that for the most part. And, and I think the telling thing is Terry Busey was good last year. Like, it, it, it seems like there's... like. It seems like the 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 variance is just so high with with year over year uh, turnover, and you know how much of that is you know new pitching coach versus old pitching coach. How much of that is managing? It just seems like the and I don't know. I, I, credit to our fan base, but I, I don't think this is a group of people that's reset any expectations at all for what this program could be. Because darn straight, they're they're one of the best programs in the history of the ACC up there in terms of like right. conference titles and maybe not necessarily Omaha appearances, which again is a whole ball of wax, but uh, the expectations are high because the tradition of winning, at least, you know, since the eighties has been pretty high. Like we don't have to get into like sixties or fifties wandering in the wilderness type thing, but it's also a different game than it was back then. And now yeah. I'm derailing my own point. So. Well, th- well, your point about the Omaha thing is salient because that is the next step. Right. Like that has been mm-hmm. the next step the entire time is to consistently be in super regional matchups and consistently be in that conversation uh, for Omaha. And that's where Georgia Tech has almost rightfully earned its reputation on, a, on at the national, the tournament level as perennial underachievers. Right. Like, yeah, there is a constant. I, I mean, when is the last time that they made it to a super regional period? Not even advanced, but just made it, right? That the last time uh, they 06, made it to Omaha, when they went to Omaha. Omaha. Yeah. Yeah. It, so you're talking about almost 20 years now. Yeah. Right, of on the verge of the yeah. same old result. And, and it's not just, the, okay, they're making the tournament every year, they're lockstep and like they're shoe ins, they're, they're, always going to be in that mix and oh they just can't like randomness is getting them out of the hump but in the last 10 years right in the uh, jake and akshay era of being in georgia tech they <laughs> missed the tournament half of those times like it, yeah it never felt like of, it, it, it's never felt like the arrows truly pointed upward in a real yeah. way that you could be like okay you have you put you can put real faith in that it's it's a flat a little bit of burst spurts of up and then noticeable drop down Pick it up a little bit flat. It's it's it, it's not pointing on the regular up in any way. Uh, I, I I'm thinking about when we when Pastner got canned. It's just it seemed like eventually there was just Jay Bat just and the, the current le- athletic leadership. I think saw like there is not a very prominent like he may be a good coach. He's a solid dude, of course. Still lives in Atlanta, as Ken told us. Awesome guy, but just like clearly that program was not going to get to a spot it needs to be under him. And I don't 
though, and, and uh, obviously Danny Hall is a very different case because he's been here for so, so, so long. He's got an honorary degree and absolute tech legend in so many different ways. But I, the thought process that went behind the Josh Pastor removal, I wonder how far down the line they've gotten to that with Danny at this point, because eventually you got to turn things. Like basketball, baseball is a very prominent Georgia Tech sport. You can't just float like this forever. Um, when, it's just a matter. constant when sense you, of malaise. Right. Yeah, like well, right. for the last five or six years, it's just been that they're putting the same product on the field yeah, right? yeah. outside of that 2019 season. Yes, you can give them COVID like they're, they're, I think we, we kind of talked about the 20 season as being sort of that like what could have been. But the last but, like 21, 22, 23, now 24, it's the same story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and and granted, and even before. that whole team that whole team is turned over, but like they still got swept by UGA that year. Like I, I remember that it yeah. wasn't fun, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it, it's, it's, know. it's 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 you know it's notable that when the there's only a couple of pieces that don't change, and the rest of it's not changing the results any further in, in any substantial way that would signify real progress is coming to the team. Uh, I mean, as you say, randomness is definitely part of baseball, but you eventually average out to where you should be over a 20 year span uh so uh, that and the results in those last 20 years are telling they absolutely are um i'm just thinking about right now like where would we be without drew burris right now too like this team wouldn't have anything to really identify with like we're the drew burris team right now and without him it's i mean it's the catcher youth thing's not exactly in an elite stage like we don't have any elite like obvious first rounder right now it's just drew I mean, obviously, a couple of good pitchers, still some relatively good hitting. Like, our averages in the lineup are not bad at, at all. But, uh, like, what the, it, this is all this is all this entire season is resting on one guy right now. If he gets hurt, <laughs> that's that that's the season. Yeah. And the way that this team is set up, the entire team is subject to, and, and the way that this team has been producing, let me be clear, is subject to the variance of one guy who is extremely young. And still has time left in this season for opposing pitchers to adjust to him. Now, that being said, halfway through the season, it doesn't seem like it seems like they've started to a little bit, but but it's college and college pitchers make mistakes at a much higher clip than than pro pitchers do. And there's there's that that we always have mm-hmm. to consider that. But still, you put all of your eggs into the we will shoot and we will outshoot you on a regular basis basket. And not into the we will do the right things on the mound, or like not even spec a little bit into the we will do the right things on the mound bucket, right? Like you have to be holistic, like to win championships, to win regionals, to to be top of the sport. You have to be at least at modicum of well rounded. If you're going to hit this well, go for it. That's fine, but you can't win like. It's just not feasible, just the way that baseball works and the way that the ball bounces. It's not feasible to say, okay, I'm going to win every game 11 to 10. Right. Because 10 is still a lot. <laughs> right? I, I don't know. I, I think we're kind of starting to talk in circles, and, and I think what we're saying is there needs to be an evaluation of this program um, and at least seeing what what needs to change. Right? Like you, you tried the pitching coach. The hitting coach has been good. Hitting, hitting has been consistent. You've tried the pitching coach. Recruiting's what been else? good. Recruiting yeah. has been good. So, what else can we? What else can we change? What else can we evaluate? Where, where, where are we going wrong in our, in our process? Is that talent evaluation? Is that talent translation? Is that player development? Which, which piece is not working the way that we expect? And then we sort of root cause from there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That whatever that whatever that process looks like, I would imagine they're thinking about to wake that or something like that. Like there's always constant evaluation happening, but yeah, they figure out where, where, where what's broken. You got to find, find out what's broken so you can fix it. So got to debug the whole machine to figure out what's wrong. Have they tried turning it off and back on again? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <sighs> and on Jack, that you're note, funny guy, you know that? Yeah. And on that note, let's take a quick break back in the tech. Yeah. As always, this uh, this podcast and this site brought to you by Section103.com. Section103 is the best place to find Georgia Tech apparel. Just a quick note from them. Shipping uh, is currently uh, not happening. It will resume April 5th, so keep an eye out there. As always, 
free shipping over 70 bucks on items from Section 103. You can find them on Twitter at Section 103. And as always, drop a, a line from us and, and use code uh, FTRS for 10% off. And uh, we hope you support us as well as our fine associates over at Section 103. Welcome back to Signs of the Southland for Monday, April 1st, 2024. Let's switch gears. Let's talk about the track and field team at Tech. They were in a split squad this weekend. Half of them were at Florida Relays, and half of them were in Raleigh for Raleigh Relays. Mr. Grant, what do you have for me from Florida? Yeah, just a bit from Florida, a couple first places, uh, the 4x800 Relay, Kayla Rose, Gracie Marston, Allie Walker, and Lottie Chappell. Uh, you know, winning a relay is great, uh, as I'm one to say. Winning a relay at the Florida Relays is, is also quite good to see as well. Billy Carlton also got first place in the men's uh, 3K steeplechase, so great to see there. And Nick Nyman uh, second in the 15. 15- hundred meters uh, so in general a couple uh really nice finishes around the top half i'm interested to see how that translates to the upcoming outdoor track and field rankings i believe those release here soon and uh yeah it's uh it's really the first stake in the ground we have to compare them a- across the board because as we note they were also in raleigh uh, so you know you don't really get that full team effect until i guess acc's yeah, and just to talk about Raleigh a little bit, a couple couple good times here and there. Uh, Cole Miller and Tristan Autry placed, uh, did really well in the, in the 3K steeple, both finished uh, under nine and a half minutes. Um, in the 10K, Devin Wade with a 29-39-92 time. Um, in the women's 5K, Mary Brady and Hel- Helena Lindsay uh, with a 16.09 and a 16.23 respectively so a good competitive set of, of times coming from raleigh um i think there was a little bit more action i think this the both of these events um, both in florida and in raleigh were a little bit weather um weather affected so there might have been a little bit more today but uh, if there were we'll, we'll make sure you are updated on that next week uh, the next event for track and field they'll be back in Gainesville for the Tom Jones Memorial. That'll be on the 12th and 13th of April. Gentlemen, shall we move over to the tennis courts? Sure. That sounds affirmative to me. The number 32 Georgia Tech men's tennis team back in action, hosting a duet of games versus number 14 FSU and number 50 Miami. A 4-3 loss a close decision to FSU, and then a 4-1 bounce-back win versus Miami. Jack, what do you have for me on this FSU series? Uh, singles, guess singles-wise, matches weren't terribly close, so that, that was a deserved 4-2. Martin, Andres Martin, number 60 in the country right now. He was playing uh, the number four player in the country who's uh, uh, Kornut Shovdek, I want to say is is how you say his name here, but he won 6-3, 6-3 of the number four player in the country. So that is telling for whenever he gets to singles tournament time uh, down the line, which is really nice to see. And then Chris Aurora was the only other guy that won for us all the other singles matches were absolutely not close. Um, Doubles won pretty handily as well in the two matches that we won. Uh, And then Miami, nice to just, you know, beat a team. And also, FSU's 14 in the country, so like they're good. Uh, we're what, sitting 32, and then Miami's 50. So that was a match we should have won that we won. Yeah, good. It uh, lost the doubles point versus Miami, but a clean sweep uh, in the singles department as well. So, so good to see that bounce back there. Uh, I'll add that I think, Jake, we've been talking about this team having a lot of near misses for their quality top line wins. And to me, that FSU. Close loss qualifies. Right. It's another opportunity for a marquee win, and it was just right there. Um, and FSU just just well, was better on the day. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think it's you know again it's an opportunity that'll come along. Um, but uh, at least the individual uh, wins I think are certainly worth noting. Uh, that's. Uh, yeah, that, that that's something that may not translate in the wins and losses form now. Uh, but I mean, Andres has always 
kind of been the guy, right? And, and it's good to see him. Uh, good to see him playing in, in terms of uh, taking top line talent uh, to the brink. There. Um, one thing I do want to note is the those those games and sets do matter. I mean, if you can improve your ranking and get yourself a better draw, uh, come NCAA time. I mean, it, it's it's not something that translates to wins and loss or, or team making the tournament or anything like that. And obviously, he's number sixteen in the country, so he's pretty darn good as is but you know if you can not face that uh number one guy in, in what would that be like the third or fourth round like that's that's more power to you yeah. mm -hmm. push push that off as far away as it could be and and that'll be good but you know just yeah, a thought uh, absolutely uh before we talk about fixtures coming up let's flip over to the women's side of ken byers the number 20 overall georgia tech women's tennis team had a two game set this weekend the first versus notre dame a four three tight decision uh won the doubles point and split the singles versus notre dame and then versus louisville later in the weekend a quick clean and easy 7-0 victory jack you were on site for louisville anything interesting stick out to you uh i i checked louisville's ranking and i couldn't find it so that verified what i thought i saw on the court was that they're just not that good uh compared to the rest of the acc uh Carol Lee and Shara Brewer just absolutely wiped the floor in their doubles match and i think in like 20 minutes like i literally think it just took 20 minutes for them to finish it was quick and quick and easy um, and then we were up pretty quickly in all the singles matches. So it was clear to me that it was just a, a very much overkill. And we won a lot of sets, 6-1, 6-2, 6-0, stuff like that as well. So, um, yeah, I think it was what you need to do against a team like that. And uh, winning right now for the 20th team in the country, like that's big. You gotta, you can't lose the easy ones like this. So I'm glad they won this well. Um, Kate, Lee and, Kate, Hira Lee and Kate Chirabura are our tops ranked either singles slash doubles like unit we have out there right now so seeing them wipe the floor like this was promising at this point in the season yeah um just a quick note on louisville they are currently uh, four and 14 uh they are the number oh. 125 team in the country and they are currently i believe the 14th ranked team in the massey ratings uh out of the atlantic coast conferences 14 teams so uh your eyes do not deceive jack in in okay. in that yeah. regard they are uh boston college is at 84 so they, they beat the second lowest there gotcha okay so yeah i mean this I mean, right now are the, the top teams right now on campus are golf and women's tennis like these are and andre spartan if you want to use that as the best <laughs> shot for, for the guys to uh <laughs> He but is like, him. I'm just a carve out. Yeah, yeah. You get you get add lump that in. Uh, so like this is I'm really curious how ACC tournaments falls to as falls and see where they're at against because they're going to play NCAA tournament worthy teams and possibly title contenders as well. Um, so they getting hot. I mean, as we said with any other sport, any other tournament based sport, got to get hot at the right time. Uh, these matches certainly do help that just to see balls landing where you want to see them go. So, uh, yeah, Lee and Jerry are. are Really, really good. They were hitting shots. I was mighty, mighty impressed by and nail and serves and all that good stuff. And it was windy also on that Sunday or that during that match as well. So they were dealing with all sorts of stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. The there are two ACC matches left on women's tennis slate. Uh, first one will be this Friday, uh, April fifth versus Clemson at home. That'll be a four p.m. for a serve for the men. There's a, there are actually four games left, four matches left. Uh, the first two, the first weekend, will be Friday uh, at Louisville. That's number 38, Louisville, on the men's side. That's a 3 p.m. first serve. And then Sunday uh, will feature Tech going up to Notre Dame. That'll be a noon first serve. After that, one weekend left for the men before ACCs. Like I said, only one more match after Clemson left. For the women and both of them are in pretty good shape to make the tournament would you say i think uh, we yeah. mentioned men ranked 32nd doing pretty well there women ranked 20th we should get both teams in a bunch of uh, ncaa doubles and singles qualifiers it should be a pretty pretty packed house come ncaa tournament time once we get there uh, but but for now uh, we will leave them to it. Let's recap 
real quick. The NCAAs for men's swim and dive. Anything stick out to you from this list of results, gentlemen? Jack, I know you were keeping an eye on this one because of an old teammate of yours. Yeah, the tech part of this meet didn't exactly, uh, as, we finished, as I mentioned last week, I was hoping they didn't uh, slide as far down as they did last year, in, but they seem to have done that. Uh, outside of Murray Caleb, who's getting six, 18th overall in the 1650 free, which was good. But no, I mentioned last week that Liam Bell, who I used to swim with, uh, in youth swimming won the hundred breasts in 49 and a half seconds, which was far and away the fastest ever in NCAA history and blew me out of the water or I wasn't in the water, but just it blew my mind how fast this kid went. It was insane. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I've seen, I'm a, a terrible breaststroker and I did not know a human could go as fast as he did on a fourth 25 at a hundred breasts. Absolutely incredible, incredible swim, which now it does impact how good our national team may become Olympics time uh, in breaststroke. Uh, that's usually an event the U S does not do that well in, and hasn't won a gold medal in, in many, many years. Uh, so that's a huge, huge thing. So uh, good, good, good prospects for the U S Olympic team. That's a Leon Marchand. He's going to swim for France. He basically won Arizona state, the meet uh, he's going to win like five medals for France this summer too. So it was kind of a, it, as always, it's like a proto Olympics there. Like a, anyone that's still in the, college age that swimming college meets they get they get some really good races in uh so there was definitely a lot of that going on so i uh, outside of tech stuff the 800 free relay at least placed but everybody else that swim individual got eliminated in prelims for our guys um Uderici was the leonardo, leonardo Uderici was the closest of anybody to maybe make a final uh, in the 100 breast as well he got 20th so he was just a couple spots off uh from getting a b final and then max Fowler got 19th in the three meter so uh, that our 400 free relay got DQ'd. So that sucks. Mom, love that for us. <laughs> mom, mom. But the only other major thing uh, that came out of the NCAAs that I saw, I guess this is a tech related, is that Bob Bowman, who is Michael Phelps's old coach, uh, yeah. right after winning the NCAA title with Arizona State, took the job at Texas. So. It was like known Texas that that was swimming dynasty never dies. It, yeah, it was known. It was their coaches like last year and stuff like that over there. And they yeah, just, like, legend of for Texas as well. So it's it, it's very yeah. much a. It, it, I'm not saying it's a Nick Saban retired kind of thing because Bob Bowman is more like the Nick Saban of swimming in terms of legacy. But it is the you you take one of the best jobs and go get arguably one of the few better jobs that exists in the world, at least in that college world. So very interesting stuff. Men swimming, uh, the, the politics of uh, the backroom dealings of men swimming never cease to amaze me <laughs> at times. Uh, the wheelings and other, the dealings. <laughs> the wheelings, the dealings. Yeah, indeed. Um, any other news and notes from around the flats before we wrap up here? Uh, I believe there was club lacrosse in action, wasn't there? There, ooh, there was uh, club lacrosse. Uh, seventh in the MCLA rankings, lost 16 to 13 to South Carolina at the weekend. A pretty close game. That's what I had in my notes here um, as I was flicking through it on Twitter. South Carolina pulled away very late, though. Um, Tech got aggressive. Tech had to keep pushing for goals if they wanted to wanted to stage a comeback. And then South Carolina put up a couple garbage goals and uh, pulled away late. So um, a valiant effort. We'll see how this team does in its next fixture uh, this weekend on Sunday versus Athens. That's a 2 p.m. start time. It's Founders Day, apparently, for Club Lacrosse. So uh, go enjoy mm-hmm. any of the festivities that they have available for you at the Sackfields. Anything else from around the wide world of sports, gentlemen? That's a big world. I don't know. I... It is a big world. <laughs> I guess my last uh, one, the Liam Bell thing, but he's a DeKalb kid, so that was like an Atlanta. That's a big Atlanta win. Uh, that was a win for Atlanta, which is cool. And there's been like three or four DeKalb swimmers that have done really well, including Dean Ferris, who still has the 200 freestyle record from his time at Harvard. So it, it, he was like the last one of that of that batch that was from DeKalb that was at a nationally level, very very good. So we our little swimming island had its moment. Hopefully, it's not over. 
I uh, I think Wide World of Sports keep an eye out. Uh, well, of course, tonight it, it'll be after after this goes out or before this goes out. Uh, there, there's uh, women's March Madness, uh, men's and women's wrap up this coming weekend. We've got baseball. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to watch spring professional football, but that's out there. But uh, I, I think all in last weekend, I, I caught glimpses of at least glimpses of seven different sports to met college, college hockey frozen four is coming up too. it's i mean this is this is sports overload week we've yeah, got it is we've got uh a lot of it uh, through oh. through next monday so let's let's mention crystal lamprecht is playing the masters we still we, yes that's a big big thing coming up here so and he as we remember he was two leading, weeks right yeah in two weekends he was leading the british open after round one last year so uh, he's got major potential. I don't think he's played Augusta before, so this will be very... He goes from... Uh, we, we have, what, that one tournament left, and then he goes and plays Augusta, and then the next weekend is ACC's. Uh, so he's got some big... He's got his very big, very big tournaments ahead of him coming up. I actually... Uh, well, before we get out of here, I want to I want to bring this up. Do you know you can buy a Masters Party host kit now? Yes. Yeah. No, I almost did this last year. I didn't wait. It's been a thing for more than one year. I thought this was new. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I I tried to bar- get my dad to buy it so that we get the pimento, so we get the pimento cheese sandwiches at the brewery during while we watched the, while we watched the best. They just, they're sold out of the basic kit, by the way. So okay. you can't says- buy you can't buy the basic. You can buy the large one, which is one hundred and eighty dollars plus free shipping. You still got to pay taxes, but free shipping yeah. in the in the kit. Let me read let me read what it's got. 24 ounce tin of egg salad, 24 ounce tin of pimento cheese, 24 ounce tin of pork barbecue, six packets of plain potato chips, six packets of barbecue potato chips, six cookies, six packets of Georgia pecan caramel popcorn, a sleeve of 25 Masters branded souvenir cups. What a sleeve of 12 sheets of Masters branded wax paper, a pack of 12 Masters coasters, and hosting kit materials. Note bread and buns for your sandwiches are not included. This has this has massive COVID takeout energy in a way that I don't think I've seen in like two years. But it's like, wow, you know, just longer just than slap that, it all but... in a box and send yeah. it out. But you know, like so Jake, May we're, we're 2020, this, right? don't let your local businesses die. This, this is that energy right there. So, so Jake, I should uh, place one of these and, and send it over to your house, right? I said, I, I'm a seafood guy. I see food. I eat it. Like, let's go. <laughs> we should wrap up. I want to go watch Kaylin Clark. I got to go. Okay, eat dinner, too, Jake. Boys. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. Thank you for discussing the master's hosting kit with me today as well jake where can the people find us yes as always you can find us at from the rumble seat.com you can email us at from the rumble seat at gmail.com uh you know we're always looking for ideas so feel free to send them our way even if it's you know guests that might interest you let us let us know what your thoughts are there and we'll we'll try our best to make it happen um in terms of twitter you can find us at fqrs blog i'm at jake grant 98 jack sat jack nicholas you can find us uh, at FTRS blog, and you can find section 103 at section 103 or section103.com. Remember code FTRS for 10% off. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at From the Rumble Seat, and you can find this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. Please rate, review, tell your friends. We really do appreciate it. Until we hear you, until you hear us next time. Good night, good luck, and go Jets. <laughs>